everyone and welcome to a new instalment of Teach Me in 10, a video series where we ask scientists to explain their research area in a grand total of, you guessed it, 10 minutes. My name is Laura, I'm a senior science writer at Technology Networks and for this episode I am joined by Elizabeth Newman. Elizabeth works as a postdoctoral fellow at Vanderbilt University and she works within the Mass Spectrometry Research Centre there. Today she's going to explain what imaging mass spectrometry is and how this technique can be used to investigate and visualise biological processes within the body. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Elizabeth. The timer is set and off you go. Before I get started, I just wanted to show all of the collaborators at the Mass Spectrometry Research Center and Vanderbilt Medical Center that made this research possible. And so with special thanks to Richard Caprioli and Jeff Spragans for their guidance. Um, everyone I've worked with is really wonderful. So today I'm going to be discussing how we measure the chemistry in different biological systems. Largely, we as mass spectrometrists study small metabolites, lipids, peptides, and proteins. Peptides and proteins are encoded by genes and are the workhorses of many biochemical pathways. But the product of these pathways in some intermediates consists of small metabolites and lipids, both of which are involved in signaling, although small metabolites are more involved in signaling. And lipids compose of the bilayer of the cell, allowing it to take certain shapes and anchor certain peptides and proteins. Nonetheless, all of these are fundamental to life as we know it. So what we do is we use matrix-assisted laser desorption, ionization, imaging mass spectrometry to visualize all of these different types of uh, chemicals or molecular distributions within a, uh, within a system. So in brief, we have a tissue on a conductive slide, usually we use indium tim oxide. We then apply a Maldi matrix and for um, just an idea of what this function, pretend it's like dynamite. And so we spray often or sublime this um, chemical matrix onto the tissue. We then ablight this chemical matrix with a UV laser. So the matrix typically absorbs in the UV range and then it explodes outwards um, in a mixture of analyte and matrix. And this matrix enhances the ionization of different chemicals. And so at each one of these different positions, we collect a mass spectrum. And so I'll talk in more detail about what this means in the next couple of slides. But what I want you to just uh, get a handle on is each position we fire the laser, we get one of these mass spectra. And each one of these mass spectra have um, hundreds to thousands of dis discrete mo uh, molecules we can then visualize. And so for each one of these little peaks, we can then um, recolor our tissue where each pixel is an ablation spot and get the distribution or visualize the distribution of um, hundreds to thousands of different chemicals. And then we can perform multivariate statistical analyses to distribute them into classes, for instance. And so today I'm going to be putting um, the use of imaging mass spectrometry into context of two projects, the first of which is the Human Biomolecular Atlas program, where um, we're a, a giant consortia of many different universities, Vanderbilt li listed here, which is where I'm from, although Harvard's participating, Florida, Stanford, and many other universities. And we're mapping the chemicals within different uh, tissues, such as the bladder to tonsils to the liver, um, in our case, we're looking at the kidney. And so for those of you that are unfamiliar, the kidney is composed of the cortex medulla and these renal pyramids. Here's a, an, a, an example schematic here. And um, the kidney filters waste through nephrons, which are these uh, consists of a glomerulite unit and tubules where the where contaminants or waste within the blood are fil filtered out within these nephrons. And there's like millions of nephrons within a kidney. So what we're trying to study is the chemicals within this kidney, kidney and see what actually uh, constitutes or composes a normal human kidney. And how does this vary as a function of age, demographic, and sex? And so we use so we use imaging mass spectrometry. Here on the left is an average mass spectra from a human kidney, uh, focusing on the small metabolite range, so below 700 mass to charge units, or about 700 Daltons. So here on the left, as you can see by each individual peak, we're detecting hundreds of different um, small metabolites here. Now, not all of them are biologically relevant. Some of them are sampling artifacts, although um, we went through and labeled some ones uh, we're fairly certain or have biological biological significance. And so as a reminder, each one of these peaks is a discrete molecule. And so um, while I'm talking about small metabolites here, 
uh, any peaks that show at a higher uh, mass to charge ratio are, are associated with like lipids such as between this mass region, peptides or proteins and like a higher mass region above that. And so what we can do is find a measured mass to charge ratio and then determine its mo the, what molecular formula um, has this mass to charge ratio. And then using a series of um, database searching and tandem MS, we can then assign each of these M over Z values um, to a different small metabolite, such as choline, which is a lipid precursor, um, an altered amino acid, a vitamin here, um, a pre another precursor to a lipid, and then a tripeptide, um, and ending with heme. And so we have a very wide mass range between 86 M over Z values, which is incredibly small, to 600, which is um, towards the end of this mass range. And so these are some example images we get with mass or imaging mass spectrometry. Here on the left is a microscopy image where this region right here is the cortex of the kidney. This is the medulla and then this is the renal pelvis. And so I'm showing seven different ions here, such as the uh, distribution of choline, arginic acid in the, the cortex, acetyl carnitine within the medulla. Um, an unknown ion, so we don't always know what the ions we're looking at are, and so this is why this is particularly powerful, so we can say and identify or detect ions or chemicals that we know the identity of and some that we do not, that we can then later identify with a series of experiments. Um, enosine and then heme. Heme's actually probably, it looks like localized a lot to the um, ventricles within the kidney, which makes sense because that would have a high abundance of heme. And so to orient you, areas with blue are low intensity of said ion, yellow is high intensity. And so what we can get is a, a chemical map of where each of these ions are located within the kidney. We can take this a step further and look at lipids, or, or here's an example of lipids, and look at different um, human patients. And so here on the left is a 21 um, white male, where this is the medulla and this is the cortex, so we can visualize glomerulites, those little blue dots there, um, some tubules, another series of tubules in the medulla. And so this is an example of three different lipids. And so while I'm only showing three different lipids in this one image, um, three different lipids are shown in all of these different um, kidney cross sections. And again, these are only several of the several hundred that we're detecting within the human kidney. And so we have patients ranging from 21 to about 78, although there's a 73 year old here, a mixture of sexes, and then um, mostly, mostly white patients, although we have um, five of 40 of the patients are black. And so what this allows us to do is visualize, oh, okay, these are the lipids present in the glomeruli. Um, they seem to be consistently present within glomeruli in multiple patients. And then we can parse out which patients say this SM um, or sphingomyelin is not present in and so on and so forth. We can then make molecular profiles of individual sections or organ or uh, organ regions within the kidney, such as a medulla profile and see how this varies as a function of demographic. And while I'm showing kidney mostly, um, there's nothing limiting us from performing this analysis on different organs. And so we've um, collaborated with others at HubMap to look at the spleen, the pancreas, the colon, and the small intestine. So again, these are chemical maps of three different lipids that we're visualizing, but we can see different biological regions such as red pulp in the spleen um, and then multiple layers in the intestines, even some islets in the, in the pancreas. And so imaging mass spectrometry is an incredibly powerful technique that allows us to look at the chemicals in many different organs at about 10 micron spatial resolution. And so most of these images I've shown are um, over 100,000 pixels and take about eight hours to acquire. And so the next project I'll discuss as an application of imaging mass spectrometry involves infected um, kidneys. And so staff and um, other antibiotic resistance infections cost billions of dollars a year. And we don't really have a good understanding of how the host responds to these both antibiotic resistance infections and non-antibiotic resistance infections. And so our model organism of choice is the mouse and our um, pathogen of choice is staph. And so staph um, is shown as this purple sphere in this electron microgram. 
Um, and the interesting thing about staph is there's no cilia and there's no flagella. And so it's a stationary bacteria that um, replicates in both the X and Y dimension. And because it can't move, it tends to form these abscess structures within um, the host. This is an, an example of an abscess structure that just looks diseased compared to the rest of the tissue. And so what we use is imaging mass spectrometry to explore um, the host pathogen interface. So here's an average mass spectra of the infected kidney, again, where each one of these peaks is an individually uh, detected chemical. I've labeled some here, so we're able to detect phosphatidylcholine, sphingomyelins, um, and some other lipids, hexaramides. Um, we can even detect even more in using negative, uh, negative mode imaging mass spectrometry. And so what this looks like is uh, this is an entire cross-section of a mouse kidney. It's mouse, much smaller than the human, so we're able to image the entire thing with imaging mass spectrometry. And here on the outside is the cortex with this uh, layer of false colored green is the inner cortex. The center is the medulla, and these um, areas that are falsely colored blue are abscesses. And so um, with microscopy, which I won't show here, we can actually see that the center um, is where the staph is located, and this outside is the abscessed and the immune response from the host. But even using just three lipids here, we can visualize many of the regions within the kidney as well as the abscess itself. We can expand our analysis to include nine lipids and get three different chemical images of the same kidney. Again, this is the same kidney, just false colored um, with the distribution of three different lipids in each case. So we get nice um, chemical information of each of these abscesses. And even um, some lipids are detected in high abundance in a small number of abscesses. In fact, not all of them. The center one, for instance, uh, we don't detect PE, this PE or this phosphatidylethanolamine lipid. And so while I'm again only showing the example of nine lipids here, we actually detected several hundred. And so here's a further subset of about 30, uh, 30 different lipids. And so some of the lipids localized to mouse structures within the kidney as uh, seen on the left, all of these are required at 10 microns. And so we can um, visualize uh, the cortex and the medulla and areas around the abscess. Some are um, abscess localized lipids. And so they localize pretty exclusively to the abscess. And so it could be a response of um, the host. So lipids that are produced in response to, um, to the abscess and to the staph infection, and some could be produced by the staph. It's difficult with this um, to tell, and we're doing um, orthogonal experiments to kind of determine where these lipids are coming from. And then there's shared lipids. So lipids that are shared by both the host and perhaps the staph or the immune response. And so because lipids are so complicated, some of these are likely isomers. And so we'll, by the use of standards and ion mobility mass spectrometry, we'll be able to further separate these distributions. So in summary, I hope I've de demonstrated that MALDI IMS can be used for a variety of biological samples. Elizabeth, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Absolutely great episode and congratulations for successfully completing Teach Me in Turn. Um, so for anyone watching that wants to learn a bit more about what Elizabeth does, there'll be a link in the description to her research page. And um, for now, bye, but please stay tuned for more installments of Teach Me in Turn. Thank you.